Designs on the Future is a new open invitation to tackle tough issues and exciting opportunities. It's directly inspired by Salzburg Global's radical roots, and we see it as a call to action at this moment of converging crises in health, economies, climate, structural injustice, and inequity. Salzburg Global Seminar itself has radical roots. We were born out of conflict in 1947, the brainchild of three young people. They met at Harvard and were inspired to see governments creating the Marshall Plan for the reparation of the economies of Europe torn apart by so many years of war. But our young founders had a different vision, a deeply human vision, which was a Marshall Plan of the mind how could you create the conditions for societies, communities, and individuals to flourish in the future, whatever the atrocities that had gone before? We have stood the test of time. We're nearly 75 years old, and we now have over 38,000 fellows in around 175 countries. We are completely nonpartisan. We're completely independent. And that goes to the heart of our mission to challenge current and future leaders to shape a better world. We also have a deep decades old commitment to rising young leaders and non-standard voices. There isn't a hierarchy of who comes to this table. The idea is really that we share collective intelligent, intelligence in an inclusive way to really tackle the big problems of our time. We normally, when it's not COVID time, work all over the world. But we are based in the wonderful Schloss Leopoldskron, and you see the library behind me. And it was from these very rooms that the Salzburg Festival was founded a um, hundred years ago this year, and where uh, the Sound of Music film also had some of its movie locations. Now we focus on how we can transform systems in critical areas, uh, in health, uh, in cities, in education, but also with a big focus on strategic leadership and foresight in critical areas that can influence the, the world of tomorrow. We work therefore around finance and corporate governance, public sector strategy, law and technology, and much more. Philanthropy and impact investment is an important area of our work because we're really thinking about how looking forward, resources in the world can be better aligned to meet the needs of a healthy planet, healthy people, and much greater justice and equity. The very first program we did in our Designs on the Future initiative was called Has Democracy Become a Spectator Sport? And it featured Stacey Abrams uh, and Will Dobson. If you're interested, you can catch up on the whole of that um, on our website. Today's topic is equally meaty and it's equally urgent. How can leaders support racial healing? This is not just an American question, far from it. It's a global question. George Floyd's murder, of course, seized global attention. It sparked global mobilization around Black Lives Matter, as well as a backlash that we are all only too painfully conscious of. But this goes much, much deeper than a single country, a single region, or a single set of crises. Every country and every region has the specificities of its own history, its own culture, whether that's around colonialization, slavery, or many kinds of abusive systems. And those patterns of inequity have cascades of consequences. There are many lenses of discussion for us opening today, from the deeply human fundamentals, individual rights, dignity, and equality of chances in life, right the way through to the more technocratic and data-driven, the opportunity cost to our societies when we neglect or exclude so much of human talent and human potential. And there are, as we go into our debate, you'll be able to dive deeper with our great speakers around that. We are very interested, as I said, in what can be done now by those who hold influence and who control resources. But before I introduce our speakers, I want to emphasize that Salzburg Global Seminar is not a spectator in this conversation. We're not a middleman. Our own historic premises that you see behind me are themselves rooted in power and abuse of power. And we've been challenged by some of our fellows quite rightly to start to think about and explore our own past and current practices. These sets of discoveries have not always been easy. 
we've had to remind ourselves in our teams about our own mantra to be tough on the issues and kind on each other. So we're now beginning a new journey, again with the help of our incredibly diverse fellowship. We're not alone on this journey, and I'm so grateful to our wonderful board for being part of these new sets of commitments. As we look forward, we're seeking to develop across all our programs, specific strategies to address structural racism and social and environmental injustice, uh, consistent with the sustainable development goals. We want to do more than that. We want to communicate much more clearly how we're trying to address these issues, to document our influence and to measure our results. And lastly, we're conscious, and we thank you for this, that we have a platform that is unusually open and diverse. And we want to give opportunities for our Salzburg Global Fellows to amplify their own voices and to take leadership on racial, social and environmental justice in the ways they tell us they need. So that was a little bit of introduction, but I wanted to speak from the heart and in recognition of all the efforts made in our team, because it is a learning journey. And I'm very grateful now to turn to our two great speakers for today, who themselves are opening up about the journey that they as people and that they as institutions are following. So first, um, I'm delighted to introduce La June Montgomery Tabron. Uh, you'll find her full bio in the chat box. La June is the president and the CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation in Michigan. She's the first ever African-American president and CEO to lead the foundation, and she's had over 30 years working with them. The foundation is coming up to its 90th birthday. I think La June will tell us more about that. And it's guided by the belief that all children should have an equal opportunity to thrive. And they work specifically in communities with vulnerable children to ensure that they can realize their full potential in school, in work, and in life. The W.K. Kellogg Foundation has been an extraordinary supporter of Salzburg Global Seminar's work over the long arc of our history. And that has manifested itself specifically in their investing over time in young leaders to foster public service and collaboration, authentic community engagement, and to give those young Americans international exposure. Stacey Abrams, who so many of you will know and who see her so active on our television screens right now, is herself a W.K. Kellogg Fellow and a Salzburg Global Fellow, and she is still supported by the foundation. Kirk Wickman, and you can find his bio in the chat box, uh, is going to bring us insights from a very wide ranging career on Wall Street and deep experience as a senior lawyer. Since 2008, uh, Kirk has worked with Angelo Gordon, and he's now the president. They are a $40 billion global alternative asset manager. And he's also worked in Morgan Stanley and many other financial institutions. Kirk also serves on the board of directors of the Red Cross in Greater New York. You might be asking, how did this come about, this pairing on our panel, Kirk and Lajune? Well, I said earlier, we have a commitment to bridge divides and to transform systems. And when we set out to think about how we can expand equity, we wanted to bridge those worlds of philanthropy and private sector finance. And as you will hear, the Kellogg Foundation and Angelo Gordon are part of the partners that are thinking about expanding in equity in the finance sector. So without more ado, I would like to open up the conversation with, with La June uh, first. Um, I'm just going to check that she is unmuted. She is unmuted. And so we're going to dive in. La June, we're going to kick off with about five minutes of free flowing conversation together. I'd really like you to start with saying a little about your own personal journey and vision, remembering that you said to me on the preparation call that you are so mindful of these deep rooted divisive constructs that we've all grown up with. So tell us a little bit about that journey and how those divisive constructs have marked your own, your own life. Thank you, Claire. And I have to say that it's a pleasure to be back with Salzburg Seminars. I uh, had an experience with Salzburg in the late 90s that I will speak about, but it's just an honor and a privilege. Thank you for having me here. Uh, yes, my journey um, is one that goes all the way back to my, my familial roots, which is in Mississippi. Uh, and if you uh, know about the 
the migration of people from the, the South in the United States to the North, my family made that migration. And uh, I was then born in Detroit, Michigan, number nine of 10 children uh, in a family where my father had to leave Mississippi in order to pursue opportunities uh, in the United States. And so that was a part of my life and a part of my background. Um, but I became uh, an accountant. Uh, thank goodness my family believed in education and uh, was very intentional about making sure that all 10 of us children were well educated and had opportunities. Um, but in my adult life, after becoming a, a, a CPA and, and pursuing a financial background, I was introduced to the W.K. Kellogg Foundation in 1987 and offered an opportunity to become its uh, controller at the Kellogg Foundation. And so you take this finance person and bring them into a space where uh, our mission is about improving the lives of all people and making sure that people have equal opportunities, particularly children and families. And it just spoke to my heart. Uh, perfect combination of, of my passion and my life's journey with uh, my profession. And so after working for the Kellogg Foundation in, starting in 87, in 97, I had the opportunity to join the Salzburg Seminar on Diversity and Inclusion. Um, and that changed my life. Uh, when you think about the word healing, I understood the, the importance of healing during that seminar when I watched a conversation between an Israeli and a Palestinian uh, talking about the journey that they were having on uh, that conflict. And it truly changed my life. And what it made me understand was uh, at, the, at the core of all of this divisiveness is a need for building relationships and connecting people at their core level of humanity. And I've taken that back and built that within our own work at the Kellogg Foundation as we committed ourselves, not only to diversity and inclusion, but a deeper commitment to racial equity, which meant we had to change our internal organization, as well as think about how we supported the work beyond our organization. Uh, and in walking that talk, I now fully understand that the core of racial equity is racial healing. You can't get to equity until you first connected people at a very human level. And so we can begin to speak our truths to learn our histories and our stories and to connect and find commonalities that we can then build equitable systems around. And so that's been my journey. It's been a pleasure. I'm interested in talking more about it, but uh, as an introduction, this is my life's work. Well, it's fantastic. I'm good. If I could just remind everybody on the call, please to make sure you're muted because I can hear a charming voice behind somebody, and I don't know who it is, but it will be great to have everybody muted except, of course, for Lajun. You talked about your life's work and that this is really a systemic approach. I'd love to know, have an example of something that's been particularly hard for you, and then perhaps have you lead on to the way in which you've begun to focus on the business case for racial equity. Lajun? Oh, Claire, I'm sorry. I was, uh, I, can you repeat that, please? I absolutely can. I was going to ask you, um, first of all, it will be interesting. You talked about the systemic approach. Interesting to have an example of something that was particularly tough as you with others led the foundation on this journey. And then perhaps touch before we pass on to Kirk on the work that the foundation has done to build the business case for racial equity. Great, thank you, Claire. Uh, so transformation in, is hard. This has not been an easy journey for us. Um, there was a lot of education that we needed to have and there was a lot of work that we needed to do around healing within our own institution. We, um, we had uh, a, a moment in our institution where um, the dominant white uh, 
employees were feeling uncomfortable and threatened. And we actually had a, one of our white male employees stand up in a staff meeting and ask, when will it be the white man's turn again, as we were talking about our work. Um, and so, yes, it's been a difficult journey, but the way we approached uh, the tension was to build a, a process that was not about blaming or shaming anyone. There was no guilt involved. It was a humanistic approach that was focused on healing. Um, and as we have come forward in this journey now for decades, um, we announced this year a, a global, and I want to emphasize that, a global challenge, uh, $90 million uh, commemorating our 90th anniversary, as you mentioned earlier, uh, that we want to award to innovators and people all over the world, leaders and groups of leaders who want to address the systematic mm -hmm. uh, racialized structures that we have all over our world and want to build systems that work for all. This challenge, uh, we call it Racial Equity 2030. We want to invest in those bright ideas <laughs> and those innovative ideas for the next decade. And our vision is that we will begin to dismantle systems that favor some and not all and replace them with systems, systems that provide opportunities for all. So we encourage uh, people from all over the world to send us your ideas. We want to invest information that we, uh, we are spurring and we know is possible across the nation and the world. That's a, that's a fantastic moment now to switch to, to Kirk. Um, picking up on this focus on systems and investment, Kirk, you know, you sit at the head of a boardroom table. And when we think about systems change, we know that shifting the resources uh, in the world is going to require far more than philanthropic foundations, however extraordinary um, funds like the 90 million that Lajun has just spoken of are and so welcome. Um, I'm reminded that, again, at the global scale, um, right back in 20, 2009, Mervyn King in his book on transient caretakers said that 52 of the world's top 100 economies were no longer countries, but corporations. We all understand how if Wall Street, if boardrooms can shift, this could have an extraordinary effect. So I would love to ask you, and I touched on George, George Floyd's murder earlier, how has it been like inside your institution, thinking about institutional response to what you have seen? Um, and how, uh, what has it reminded of you both in your own life story and as you look out? Well, first, uh, Claire, I'm delighted to be here, and especially with Lejeune. Uh, we partnered with the Kellogg Foundation. It's been a delightful experience. Uh, you're right, uh, corporations do control a lot of resources. I think the initial response uh, when George Floyd happened, and I would say, I don't have a survey to prove this, but I would say a lot of business leaders said, that's a social issue, not a business issue. I think that was the initial reaction, that that's, it's great if our employees want to get involved in that, but why should we need to get involved in that? It seems, it, it, and so, uh, there was a lot of discussions, certainly at our firm, uh, around those issues. And I know from uh, talking with colleagues at other firms, there was the, the same discussion about uh, what's, the, what's the appropriate role. Um, in our prep call, I talked um, with you and Lejeune about, about the importance of changing hearts and minds of business leaders. Um, I think business leaders too often think first of a profit. I think they are concerned about their employees, but they're, they're there to make money uh, for their shareholders, for their constituents. And, and I think that's what their focus has been. And so to a certain extent, over the past few years with the focus on ESG, environmental, social, and governance concerns, there's <coughs> certainly been more attention. There's been awakening uh, in boardrooms in CEO suites, uh, uh, certainly across America and I think across Europe and Asia as well. 
um, but I'm not sure if uh, if people were to be honest whether they're truly converted in their heart and mind on those issues or if they're more uh, a prisoner to the moment, uh, not a volunteer to the moment, but a prisoner to the moment, thinking I need to do something here because my employees are asking for it, but I'm not sure if this is really our place. And so mm -hmm. those are the initial thoughts I have in response to your questions. So that's really fascinating because you're looking at what some of those levers of change could be from the bottom up in terms of employee demand, um, but also in terms of marketplace sensitivity, sensibility. You remind me of the famous video about what is real leadership. Many of you on this call may know it, where one person starts dancing by themselves on the hill, but it's the person who gets up and dances with them, who gets the movement going. And I'm interested perhaps to draw you out more, Kirk, about what does it take to move, as you say so eloquently, from being the prisoner to being a movement builder. And then I'd like Lajun to come in on exactly that point as well, because movement building doesn't happen just within sectors and silos. Well, as, as terrifically unfortunate and horrible George, George Floyd's death was, it and, and some related events clearly in the United States that I, I think no matter where you live on the globe, you read about them. The great thing about that, the silver lining, so to speak, is it's led to a lot of hard discussions. And, and I do think people are searching their hearts and minds as to, as to what is the right thing to do? What is the role of, of uh, corporate America, if you will, to help in these issues? And um, so I do think there's been some, uh, some change in thinking, uh, which is, is critically necessary to happen. Um, you, um, I'm reminded of corporations that have had major turnarounds because someone at the top had a new vision and was able to lead out, make a difference. And I think it's the same thing here. If you have, if, if the tone at the top, if there are people who really believe um, that God is no respecter of people, that we really need uh, healing, uh, that we need to, to get rid of structural issues that we have in the United States and beyond, I think that can make a big difference. And the good news is, is there's been so much discussion of these issues, certainly in the United States, that I think there is a lot of discussion happening. And I do believe that hearts and minds are changing. Um, um, I remarked before that when I was much younger, um, uh, Martin Luther King was such a, an amazing uh, influencer here in the United States. Um, and there have been things that have happened since, but I don't think we've had that kind of moment. I think we're having that kind of moment again. And what I'm hoping is, as people talk about, it's more than a moment that it becomes more of a movement and there's permanent change, mm -hmm. <laughs> excuse me, permanent mm -hmm. change. Lajun, let me bring you in here and let's think about some of the crosswalks between philanthropy and business in this space. And I'd like to get your thoughts as you do so around the whole issue of trust and credibility. I know Coke won't take it amiss if I say that when people think of Wall Street or the City of London and the profit motive and so on, there's a set of assumptions that go with that. And so actually, how do we change the mindsets as well as building practical, demonstrable collaborations that last? I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, uh, Lajun. Thank you, yes. Uh, and to the point of movements, I believe that movements require partnerships. That's how movements happen. And if we watch what happened in this, in the George Floyd killings, the, the Breonna Taylor killing, the, the many killings that we've had to witness, um, the one thing that we've been afforded through this process is um, data information, a uh, visual of where the system breaks down. Uh, before these videos, we had denial um, and that is part of a journey. But now where we're shifting is from uh, a greater state of denial and complicity to a state of knowing. Um, and that's the beginning. And with that knowing, what we've been able to do is build the type of partnerships that are required in order to move uh, this conversation forward and to actually address some of the systemic 
issues. Um, as a philanthropy, uh, what we honor and, and pursue is partnerships. We understand that one philanthropic organization uh, cannot change uh, these issues singly, but we do know that philanthropy has a role to play. And part of that role is uh, convening uh, and we can play a, a role in convening unlikely partners. Uh, and our partnership with Wall Street is one of those types of partnerships, bringing together uh, philanthropy and um, corporate concepts in a way that can address the systems that are held within corporate America that can be transformed to provide greater opportunity. Uh, we understand in philanthropy, as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, we need partnerships with the largest economic brokers in the world. And if we can forge such a partnership and open up those systems for opportunity, there's going to be a cascading ripple effect in some other uh, sectors and uh, areas. And so you, we just believe that the partnership in, is key and bringing that awareness in a space where it can have a catalytic effect. So are you, are you finding mutual comprehension or mutual incomprehension? Those who know me know that one of my favorite questions is who don't you whoever you are, know how to talk to. And I'd love to get Kirk's view on whether Wall Street knows how to talk to philanthropies, um, how, or to nonprofits, how that, as you said before, it's hard for some CEOs to look beyond the profit, which has defined portfolio theory and their, their raison d'etre for so long. So are you seeing an, a journey or progress being made in terms of that understanding across these operational divides because you're very different ecosystems. Kirk. I think that's, I think that's right. Um, uh, we are very different systems. Um, uh, by, by way of background for the benefit of our audience, we have managed money for the Kellogg Foundation uh, for a number of years. And the Kellogg Foundation had, has asked Angelo Gordon and a handful of other uh, entities to partner with them and in, in, in looking at these issues. Um, it, it's, uh, as I said earlier, I think we're very focused on, on profit and loss. Uh, uh, and, and more than that, uh, uh, achieving investment results for our clients, because the reason we have Kellogg as a client is that we help them um, do as well as they can on their investment so that they can fund these uh, noble aims uh, that the Kellogg Foundation has. You're talking and about the so, 95% and, of the endowment as well right. as the 5% of grants. Right, exactly. and if we, and, and the fact is, is if we don't do a good job managing that money, we don't have a relationship with Kellogg. So first and foremost, <laughs> we're, required, we're required to do a really good job. And so that's where the focus is, is making sure that we achieve great investment returns for Kellogg or any other endowment, foundation, public pension fund, state pension fund, whatever it is, sovereign wealth fund that we, we serve. That said, I think the, the incomprehension, uh, again, goes back to uh, a lot of people um, starting a few years ago, but certainly this year, thinking about what is the role of corporate America in these issues? Mm -hmm. And and I do think that um, because of voices like the Kellogg Foundation, there has been a lot of good thinking around that. So and, and I think we know that it's important to our own constituents, not just our our clients, but it's important to our employees as well. There's a groundswell of interest in this. We have a diversity inclusion committee. And the activity of that group that's been in place for a couple of years has, is remarkable. And, um, uh, and so they're holding us to account, those, those of us who sit at the top of the firm. So I think we have grown in our understanding. I'd like to think that on Wall Street, across whether it's big firms or smaller firms, that there is a growing comprehension of the importance of these issues and why we have to get, get it right. 
let me <clears throat> let me come in here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was just going to share uh, to your question. Uh, we didn't know how to speak with corporate America as a philanthropy in the beginning. That was something we had to learn. Um, you'll see that we produced uh, a publication. It was called the Business Case for Racial Equity. And in that business case, what we uh, were able to do with research was to quantify uh, the lack of opportunities as they uh, were uh, emerging throughout the United States. And we went through and actually put a dollar value to that. It was $8 trillion in gross domestic product if we were not allowing every able-bodied American to be a part of the economic engine and have opportunities to grow and thrive in the economy. Uh, and that's $8 trillion by 2050. So we did have to speak in business language as we were forging these partnerships. And we had to do the reset research to understand uh, what was important for them. Um, and so I think we've learned in this journey how to make those bridges. We've also partnered with McKinsey now uh, in, in going a little bit deeper. And through our partnership with McKinsey, we've researched in the financial <laughs> services sector how people of color and those who do get opportunities to enter, how they fare throughout the process mm -hmm. and what systems and structures could change between recruitment, promotion, uh, advancement in an organization. And again, we were able to translate that into business concepts like sponsorship, internships, uh, systems that could work for more than they have been working. And those are the types of conversations we're now able to have. And Kirk and other uh, firms like Kirk's firm have come to the table in earnest. Uh, they want to understand uh, what the barriers are and what those structures are that can be improved upon because now I think there's a shared fate concept that's growing around, we need to grow the labor market fully and give everyone the opportunity to grow their talents, which will be good for everyone. So you did a beautiful transition there from looking at the <clears throat> external footprint of philanthropies and business into the lived experience within organizations. And that issue of opening up, of shifting the power, of creating opportunities for some which might lead others, that aggrieved white man that Kurt referenced, to feel left out or angry really interests us. Kurt, can you give a couple of examples of how on Wall Street, you're thinking about recruitment before we start bringing in some of our provocations. Yeah, well, I'm gonna do it in two ways, old recruitment and new recruitment. Um, look, at a firm like Angelo Gordon, because it's a, a, a very successful firm, it's not hard for us to recruit. And so we have the pick of the litter as you, as you think about it. And so we can say to ourselves, well, we're only going to recruit from Ivy League schools. Uh, um, uh, it, you know, we, we have the number of resumes we get for each open position, you know, it, it swamps, uh, the ratio is significant. Um, so, you know, there was never a need to change. And Wall Street's one of the first places to say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? If things are going well and you're making money, why would I change this process? I think um, that's old recruitment. But what that has led to on Wall Street is um, uh, a Wall Street that frankly is, is very white, is very male, um, and it, it therefore uh, does not have the representation of women it, it should, and it certainly does not have the representation of brown and black people that it should. There's just no question about it. The good news is, is that firms have awakened to the issue um, and so, and especially I think in the last couple of years, um, you know, if I were going off to college now, uh, I would think harder about going to a historically black 
uh, college or university because I think the job opportunities coming out of those schools is going to be terrific because people mm -hmm. realize there's so much talent there and we've ignored it. We haven't yeah. recruited there. So in, you know, first we educate our employees on the issues. Then we say, well, how, how can we get better? How do we attract <laughs> black and brown people? How do we attract more women? And so we have very kind of targeted programs to help us do that. And so uh, old recruitment versus new, I think we're just um, much smarter about how we go about it. And we're slowly changing the numbers, which, which needs to happen. Ultimately, we have to be accountable. Yeah, yeah. And that word slowly is a really interesting one because, of course, part of this issue is the urgency of need, the, the legitimate expectations out there and the time it takes to move forward. And I hate the word slowly. I'm impatient. <laughs> I, I, I don't I you know, I'd like it to be fixed tomorrow. I'd like to be perfect by sunset, um, but we won't be perfect by sunset. We just won't. And so the question is, is how do we get there? as fast as reasonably possible. What Definitely. big steps can we take to get there? Absolutely. I'm so pleased to hear you um, calling out the historically black colleges and universities because um, a very special initiative that was seeded in Salzburg Global Seminar, the Global Citizenship Alliance, has many, many years of working with HBCUs and bringing people together of color to Salzburg Global Seminar for global citizenship programs. Um, so it's really interesting for us to see how this recruitment is shifting. We're going to bring in our first um, provocation now and then Lajun, I'll invite you to say something when uh, our fellow has spoken. This is Bisi Alimi, a fellow um, of our LGBT forum, who's originally from Nigeria. QBC. As a black gay man who is also a refugee, and I've spent the last five years trying to engage companies to be more proactive when it comes to not just racial justice, but LGBT rights. And not just where it is comfortable, but even in challenging settings like in Global South, like Nigeria, where I come from. I have seen companies being performative about it. And the argument has always been about business, about profits. So my question is this, and I want you to be very honest about answering this question. At what point do you make a compromise about profit? over people. I know companies are not set up to be activists, but at what point do you realize that people are equally as important to you as much as profits are? And the reason why I'm saying this is America racial inequalities has been on for long. What has taken you as a business this long to realize that you have to do something about it. So let me bring La June in to have her reflections on BC's comment and then I'll pass back to Kirk. Sure, um, I think during this pandemic of COVID, uh, we've learned very, um, very specifically how important our people are. Uh, and uh, this is a moment where I think all organizations and companies are thinking about the well being of their people, both uh, its consumers as well as its employees. And, um, and particularly on the issues of, of people, LGBTQ, racial uh, differences. One thing that we've understood and research shows that uh, the more diversity you have in your organization and your company, uh, your profits actually grow because of that. It is definitely a benefit and an asset uh, and something that uh, distinguishes the top performers from the mediocre performers. And so as that realization is becoming clear and research now supports it, I think uh, there's a compelling reason to make sure that you are nurturing an environment in your organization or company that is welcome to all people. And if not, you're leaving money on the table. Mm -hmm. Kirk, 
that was B BC was was provoking very much around that profit motive and the perception that so many hold of a single set of foci foc and goals. Yeah, uh, I think BC's question is an excellent one. Look, um, uh, as a person who helps run an organization. I realize that our most important asset is not our brand. It's not the money on the balance sheet. It's not the client relationship. It's the people who go up and down the elevators each and every day. Um, first and foremost, we're about people because it's people who get you results. Um, in order for us to continue to hire the best people, we have to be an employer that people are attracted to. Um, in the past, perhaps it was um, a different considerations as to what makes a good employer. Maybe it was enough that we paid well, uh, that we had advancement and that kind of thing. It's changed now and, and BC should take heart in this. People don't want to go to an employer um, who is not uh, welcoming to all peoples. It, they just don't want to go there. Um, uh, and, and we see that uh, clearly. Uh, I, I know um, a few years ago, we tried to attract, uh, we had our hearts set on hiring somebody from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, who we thought was just one of the best potential real estate investors and would make a great addition to our real estate team. He was African-American and he, he, he was interested in the firm, and, but he asked hard questions about the number of African-American employees that we had. And I don't think our answers were satisfactory to him. So he went someplace else because at that point he said, you may be getting better, but you're not, you're not in a place where I feel comfortable joining you. Yeah. And so, boy, that was, that was a, that was a wake up call. That was a number of years ago, but we were, were certainly <clears throat> doing, uh, doing better. And so, and, and I guess the last thing I'd say to BC is that we, we are, we feel accountable to our clients. We feel accountable to our employees. And as Lejeune says, we know it's just good business. And mm -hmm. so um, I think the the page has turned where profit is the only motivation. I think historically that was the motivation, uh, but I think the page has turned on that for a lot of companies. Great, <clears throat> great timing for our second video provocation. This comes from Susan Glisson, who's a fellow of our American Studies program. And it's really for Kirk. Cue Susan. And specifically for Mr. Wickman. Racial healing is an emerging and necessary strategy for addressing and repairing past and present harm. How might racial healing practitioners like myself best introduce our methods, which include things like sitting in circles and talking about one's feelings to corporate America in a way that won't scare them off. Kirk. Wow. That's, what, that's a, what, what would not scare you? What would not frighten the horses? I, I think to Susan's question, I think Angela Gordon is at a place now where we're not scared by it. In fact, we're doing it. Um, and it, um, as we had our own kind of self-assessment a few months ago, um, with all members of our diversity and inclusion uh, council, the, the number one thing that we thought we needed is exactly what Susan described, which was, which is hard to believe, but it was. It was, it yes, was like, I'm, do I'm that amazed. before anything yeah. else. Get, get employees into small groups, and, and we have offices <laughs> in Europe and in Asia, wherever we are, get employees in small groups, get a facilitator and just talk because we think the best conversations, no disrespect to this one, uh, but we think the best conversations um, are often in small groups in a circle where you feel like it's a high trust environment and, and nothing you say is gonna be used against you and hopefully you're gonna leave the room a better person. So I actually think, Susan, that the, there is greater receptivity than ever uh, to that, I think it's uh, best driven by employees asking as opposed to having it be mandated from on high. That's not a, it's not a good way to go. Uh, so, and that's what our employees, frankly, have asked for. And so that's what we're in the process of doing. Well, that's so fascinating. But I want to bring Lajun back in because when we talked before, 
and you highlighted what you already did in this call about the importance of the term healing ahead of the term equity, but you also said that people often skip that step. So what is your experience both in your own foundation and more broadly? It is, and, and you know, people think healing is, the, is fluffy and easy, but it's actually uh, very difficult. And what we're learning is um, there's a fear of, of, of the dominant white population that um, healing is about uh, needing to reckon for all of the past uh, sins mm -hmm. and to be accountable for that. And uh, there is some reckoning, uh, but I think when healing is done right, it's about affirming all humanity. <laughs> Uh, this isn't a zero sum proposition. It's about bringing everyone together, affirming our own uh, being, our stories, who we are as people, and then opening a pathway so that we can all walk that pathway together and build something that works for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, when we talk to corporate America, one comment that was made to me is, you know, it's, it's not easy for a white male to give up the power in a space like that to begin a, a more uh, balanced and equal conversation. And, but we have to understand that. Uh, and we, we can't take that as anything more than uh, a great insight and, and make sure that when we're facilitating and building that healing space and that environment, that we take that into account and we understand how to facilitate a space mm -hmm. where there's a balance of power and yeah. there's uh, the truth telling is everyone's truth telling, not a dominant narrative. And so we are training practitioners like Susan and others across the nation and the globe to know how to facilitate those conversations and bring about uh, a level of discourse that's productive and leads to transformation. That's, that's fascinating. We're going to switch now to the first of our text provocations. And I should add that um, many of you were, ge were generous enough to share a provocation and everything will be on the website. Um, and a lot of the good things coming up in the chat box, we'll also find a way to make that visible. So the conversation certainly doesn't stop here. So our first text provocation is from uh, Katrina Scotto Di Carlo, who's a fellow of our Corporate Governance Forum. And she says, supporting small businesses is often cited as a key avenue for driving capital to communities of color in the US. But corporations and foundations are often profiting from economic pressures that are dismantling Main Street. Um, and then she gives the example that philanthropic organizations invest most of their money in Wall Street. So how can radical solutions emerge from this model, asks Katrina. Kirk. Oh, talk about structural issues and Wall Street's got a grip on managing money. There's no question about it. The, the good news is, is that there are uh, women owned and minority owned firms um, that can do well. Ultimately, they're going to be judged by their results, but they can do well. And somehow we need to um, uh, grow their profile. Uh, during the, the great, uh, the, the global uh, challenges of 2008, um, the government asked a number of firms to help it uh, rebuild something, uh, our, our mortgage markets in the United States. And Angela Gordon has expertise in this area. And so uh, there were like 100 entities that, that applied uh, for this. And um, there were eight firms selected, including Angela Gordon. But you couldn't be selected unless you aligned yourself with a women-owned or minority-owned uh, business as part of your proposal. And I actually thought that was great. Um, uh, we were so aligned. I think it was a very successful experience uh, for our partner. And so I think it's good at a more, at a, at a, a more micro level, um, we have been thinking about how we can support Main Street in the way we engage and work on a daily basis. And uh, for instance, we provide lunch for all of our employees every day. 
Um, sometimes, uh, it, historically, we've done that by buying food from big chains, uh, a lot of big chains. And recently, we've decided uh, that's got to change. We need to, we need to seek out um, uh, small businesses, and there's plenty of them in New York who serve great food, and, they, and we need to go find them because they're having trouble finding us, and we'll, we'll help support in that way. But it's, it, is, it is hard. I mean, this is, she raises a good issue. So thank you for the raising mm -hmm. the issue. Lajun, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, I would. Uh, I, first of all, I, I also think it's an excellent question. And we in philanthropy have, you know, we've been thinking about how do we put more of the money that we have to work toward our mission? And we mentioned this earlier, a, a foundation has a 5% charitable distribution payout. And so every year we're paying out 5% of our net assets. Um, but we started thinking, what can we do with the 95%? And that 95% is primarily in Wall Street, which is why we created the expanding equity uh, program that we're running right now, where we are partnering with those firms on Wall Street, with Angelo Gordon, for example, one of our money managers, and saying, we know that while we are highly invested in this market, less than 1% of the owners in this space are women and people of color. So how can we partner to expand that, to create opportunities in this most essential financial uh, sector? And, and we've begun that journey. We've had our first cohort of money managers seeking to open up opportunities in their firms and to be champions for the entire sector so that others do the same. One thing that we're learning is when you're making transformation, you need champions. You need those uh, trailblazers. And Angelo Gordon and the other firms that we're partnering with are becoming those trailblazers which will have a greater effect than their own institution. And hopefully we're going to even go beyond the financial <coughs> services sector. Yeah, really interesting. So we're going to go on to the, the next text uh, provocation, which um, is, will be coming up. So this is from Marcus Diethelm, who is a group general counsel at UBS. And um, he has, I'm going to just give one word of background. Marcus is one of 12 general legal counsel in top legal and financial firms who came together um, after the death of George Floyd um, to develop um, a public open letter talking about the responsibilities that lawyers had. And that was addressed to the whole of the global co legal community. And that is available on our website. And I think maybe really very interesting for people who are listening in, trying to think about how, as we heard, partnership or finding a common voice um, can also allow for new forms of communication. So Marcus Detown's question goes into the question, the internal operations of firms that are trying to be transformed. A common excuse to not having been able to develop and promote talents with diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds is the small available population in this area relative to average distribution. The goal, says Marcus, never should be to improve on average. Instead, we must provide for early access modules, facilitating the pathway toward entering our respective profession. So this takes us upstream as well, and reminds me of what Lajun said early on about her own pathway into becoming an accountant, which was a revolutionary act. So Lajun, do you want to talk a bit about how one can change the entry pathways and the experience within corporations and in, in companies in a little more detail? Yes, and I thank, uh, I thank you for this question. It's an excellent question and it speaks to our work. We know that there has to be a pipeline of talent and that pipeline is built in as early as possible. Uh, so we look at even early childhood education and making sure that uh, we are investing in children and the mother who's carrying the children uh, at the earliest point so that their developmental journey is one that is rich and of quality. And so, yes, uh, when you look at the systems that have failed many people in the United States and around the world, that system starts with the investment. Where are we investing our governmental resources to grow every 
person as best we can for and prepare them for their future. So education is a place that has been disinvested in throughout the world, particularly in the United States. Uh, and we know that in order to get this right, we have to invest in the early stages of a child's development. So yes, we have to build that pipeline. Then we can, because we know we've had systems that have failed, we have to look at how do we re-enter people on that pipeline, regardless of where they are now, based on the uh, obstacle they have faced. And so we have to have better systems of, of re-emerging and reinventing and allowing people to grow skills. And there isn't enough investment in that space as well. Uh, and then when you get into uh, a place where a person is learning, I think we have um, on the job learning is critical. And when young people, particularly black and brown people are not afforded internships, they don't have those, uh, the sponsorships in early parts of their career so that they can grow and make mistakes and learn from those mistakes and continue to, to prosper in that way. I think there are many opportunities for us to think about building that pipeline instead of, uh, I think every time someone says we can't find someone, uh, they're admitting to the failures of many systems before that point. And mm -hmm. instead of being complicit in those systems and then getting to the end of the journey and saying, we can't find one, let's think about how we can rebuild some of those earlier systems so you will find them because yeah. they will have a pathway to be found. Absolutely. So it's really a holistic thing. Let me pass to Kirk. And I want to just say that Marcus's question was echoed in one respect by one of our board directors, Bob Muntheim, who talked about the importance of mentorship as well. And how do <clears throat> how can that be used in a very proactive way, again, to be giving a real equality of chances and pro professional progress? But Kirk, over to you. Um, uh, look, I, I agree education is, is so key. Um, and, and the good news is if you can provide education to anyone, regardless of their color, regardless of their religion, regardless of their race, whatever, it is a great equalizer. And I think the one thing that Wall Street, it, it may lack EQ, emotional intelligence, Wall Street. But the good news is it, it, if it sees talent, it really is kind of blind to, to what, whether that talent is brown or black or whatever. It looks at the pipeline, tries to get out of that pipeline, wherever's better. So I think ultimately education is in critically important. The other thing I would say, which Lejeune was, was going to and it was referred to in the comment, I think opportunity is also of critical importance. We, uh, this past year, we, we have internships in our offices. Um, and this year, uh, I'm pleased to say that over half of our interns were black, brown, or women. And um, and, and we felt really good about that because what we're doing is providing that opportunity that otherwise wouldn't be there. I, I um, in the United States, I grew up on a farm in Iowa. I never owned a suit or tie. Uh, I, I had the good fortune of, of uh, having uh, one of my best friend's mother tell me that I should apply to the Ivy League school. And somehow I managed to get in, I think, hitting a quota for um, uh, farm kids from Iowa who still have <laughs> hay in their hair. Uh, but um, I wasn't part of, like most of my classmates, they all had ways to get summer jobs and internships. And I just wasn't connected like that. And so I have, I have empathy for the situation. And, yeah. and so those kind of, uh, what Lejeune talks about and what's uh, talked about in the commentary there is you need to provide that opportunity. And I think that's something that Wall Street is getting very good at, which is providing a lot more opportunity in these summer programs um, so that these, anybody does, so that no matter what, you get, the, you get the shot to prove yourself. And I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, you touch on this whole issue of social capital networks, of the confidence of yes. how to use networks. And for those who are excluded from them, 
um, that's so fundamental to these patterns of injustice and the difficulty of breaking yeah. through. We have about 10 minutes now to bring in some, some of the very rich comments from the chat box. But as I said before, we're going to, unless anybody doesn't want this, we're going to capture all of this and make it publicly consultable afterwards, because this is the beginning of a conversation that is very important for Salzburg Global Seminar. So the first question is from another fellow, Damaso Reyes, who's the founder of Clarity Media. And he asks you both, what specific metrics have your organizations set for themselves um, to have an impact when it comes to racial equity? Internally, do you feel your organizations are representative of the communities they serve? Great question, Lajun, you go first. Yes, and uh, we do have the metrics in place uh, across our entire uh, organization. For us, I think the key metric is the one that starts with your board, your governing structure, and what level of diversity do you have in, in your board? For us, six of nine of our board members are people of color. And that's been a transformation uh, that has happened over the last uh, several decades. When I started at the firm in 1987, uh, there was one person of color and uh, the mostly male, white males. And so we've made that transformation. Our staff are 45% people of color. And we actually not only measure in totality, but we look at all of our priority places and we look at the demographics in those places and we compare our staff to those demographics to make sure that we're reflecting the people of the communities that we serve. And I believe that's critical. And, and yes, we keep the metrics. Uh, very important to keep those metrics. We also measure our vendors. Who are we utilizing uh, as vendors and key partners of ours for our operational uh, purchases, as well as looking at our grantees and making sure our grantees reflect the population as well. So Fantastic. absolutely critical. And a lovely concrete answer. Kirk, how are you guys doing on metrics? Uh, look, we should all aspire to be as good as Kellogg has been. There's no question about it. All you need to do is spend time uh, at the Kellogg Foundation. You see that they, they not just talk the talk, they walk the talk. And, uh, and by the way, uh, when I went to my first Kellogg meeting, I was so impressed that the administrative assistants we're also participating in the meeting. It wasn't just, you know, it, it's like, it's, it's also, let's involve everybody. And, mm -hmm. and I thought it was so excellent. Look, we, we are believer in metrics. We're a financial firm. Um, and so we're held accountable uh, by our investment performance. So we believe in metrics and we do use metrics. And, and I think, you know, whether that's to educate, attract, retain, as an example of a couple of metrics that we use in the attracting candidates, um, we have, uh, as an example, the rule of two. Uh, if we have an open position, uh, we have to have two diverse candidates in the pool before we can start the <coughs> interviewing process, which I think is uh, an excellent uh, way to do it. Um, as I noted, we are starting to interview at historically black colleges and universities, which I think is good. A third thing we've done is we've gone out to identify um, minority recruiters, something we've never done. And by the way, there are numbers around those, but we want to make sure that if you want to find black and brown candidates, um, then retain those people who know the black and brown candidates. Mm -hmm. So we're using um, minority hiring firms as well. So those are examples of things we're doing um, to get us to where we need to be. We aspire to be where Kellogg is. We're not, I don't think there's a firm on Wall Street um, mm. that is as evolved as Kellogg is, but I think we see it and we're all trying to get there. So <clears throat> I'm going to bring on another question, which is, which is very rich and it may be the last live question I can give you. This is from Aravinda Sridhar, who's a student at Presidency College in Bengaluru. And Kirk, you mentioned the rise of ESG, environmental and social governance, in corporate behavior and investment. And we do see a rise in conscious capitalism. But how far is it benefiting stakeholders and helping a larger community cause, especially 
towards racial healing? What more needs to be done? Kirk first. Um, uh, we have embraced the E, S, and G considerations. In part, we think it's just good business. We have uh, a real estate business that spans the United States, Europe, and Asia. And so to us, we want to invest in uh, buildings that are good for the environment. It, 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 it helps us have lower energy costs. It helps us in the resale process. It helps attract tenants when we put gardens on the roofs of these buildings. So I think it's just good business to um, uh, embrace the E, S, and G considerations, if you will. And I think, I think Wall Street's fairly far along on that, which I think is good. I, I don't think, I don't, I think the thing that Wall Street hasn't done very well yet is um, deal so much with the racial he healing, which was uh, part of his question, uh, you know, has, uh, I, I think, I think these, if you go back to the questions asked earlier by Susan uh, about small groups, uh, I think Wall Street uh, needs to go one employee at a time, one small group of employees at a time. They need to process these issues and we just need to be better. I think we're getting there, but it's, it's still gonna take some time uh, mm -hmm. to get there, but I hope everybody holds Wall Street accountable. Okay, Lajun. I, uh, I think, you know, when we think about the sustainable development goals and I think about goal number 10, which is mm -hmm. reduce inequalities. Um, I applaud the ESG concept and, and hope that it broadens as we move forward. So that as we are talking about the different elements that what qualify as an ESG, I can envision uh, those organizations who are working fervently to reduce inequalities. And we have spoken, we've spoken at the OECD to even think about that SDG number 10 to make sure that when we say inequalities, that we're not just speaking gender, but we're also speaking racial inequalities. And we know that that's not a United States construct, that is a global construct. And we think about the global South and, and how that will be more <coughs> in, uh, included as we think about expanding that SDG number 10. And then I see that becoming part of an ESG uh, metric that can be mm -hmm. even further expanded so that yes, all of uh, corporate America and others can be accountable for mm -hmm. moving forward and reducing inequalities as they're thinking about, you know, all of the other issues that we have to attend to and be accountable and responsible for in improving our world and our planet, like climate change and all of the other ESG areas. So I see very promise in this space and definitely uh, I'm excited that the ESG uh, metric is broadening and expanding. It will be uh, a great tool for us as we're continuing to hold organizations accountable. And I think uh, consumers understand it better and they're gonna be looking for those organizations who are fully engaged and participating and improving these conditions for all. Absolutely, and making informed choices in their savings exactly. or how they do their retirement investments and so on. I'm going to cheat at the end of this incredible conversation by citing a bit of somebody's question as I invite both of you to do just some brief wrap up remarks. There's been a lot in the chat box, which my brilliant colleagues have been syn synthesizing for me around education and its role in dealing with inequity from the earliest years. But I want to pull out a piece from uh, Jeanne Tungara's um, question. She's the a retired associate professor at Howard University and a fellow. And she asks, how can corporations and philanthropists invest more in communities where educational inequities are more likely to lead to prison than college or the corporation? I've paraphrased. So I'm going to pass to Kirk. And if you want to pick up on any of that in your wrap up remarks, Kirk, that would be great. Yeah, I. Um, that's one of the issues that bothers me the most and why I applaud what Kellogg is doing because um, uh, 
children of challenged families just don't, it, it's hard to imagine them being able to rise above and to be able to enjoy some of the successes in life that many of us enjoy because they, they are in such a bad place. So I believe fully in what Kellogg is doing by strengthening families and that will strengthen children and the families that need to be strengthened most are those who are uh, uh, in a lot of black and brown communities and economically challenged communities. There's no question about it. I, I think the, the other thing that I would add there uh, as, a, as a statement of wrap up is that I, I, I really believe that we need to win hearts and minds. Um, I think that's, that's, that's to me where the real battle is. And, and when I think about the ESG considerations, I applaud what Lejeune just said about um, dealing with, I almost, I hate to say this is probably politically unpopular, but I care more about the people than I do with the environment. I'd rather have a new letter in ESG that just relates to people, inequality or whatever, than, than before the environment, uh, because I think people is what we should care about most. And frankly, I think ultimately, whether you believe in God or not, I think, I think we should be judged, uh, not just on uh, how we treat our spouses and how we treat our children, but how, how we function in the community and, and whether we're doing what we need to do to lift up those who are most challenged. And so I, I, I applaud those people who are doing that. And I hope we can continue on a mission of changing hearts and minds, because when we do that, we'll, we'll be able to get beyond these issues. Thank you, Kirk. Lejeune. Great. Um, so our founder, Will Keep Kellogg, uh, created the Kellogg Foundation. And one quote we always uh, restate is when he said education offers the greatest opportunity to improve one generation over another. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've taken that to heart. Uh, and he knew that in 1930, he knew that. Uh, and unfortunately, those who were not interested in creating opportunities for all knew that which is why you know, systems have been in place that uh, do not invest in education and do not allow all people to grow uh, with that quality educational experience. Uh, so as I think about our work moving forward, um, and we've said this a lot at the Kellogg Foundation, uh, we're trying to create systems that work for all. Uh, the educational system is one that doesn't right now work for all. And we actually invested in a pilot in one of our communities where we took a very impoverished school system and just gave it the resources that any other school system in the suburbs would have. We created the equality that did not exist. <laughs> And just by creating that equality in the investment of that institution, child outcomes began to, to grow. The children do benefit and it's not because of their families, it's because of the lack of investments and the tools and materials they have to grow and become those aspiring uh, adults uh, with confidence to pursue whatever they want. And so as I close and we think about racial equity and, and, and I agree with Kirk, it starts with racial healing because people create these systems. Systems don't just emerge on their own. And if we start with healing, you have someone who now understands one humanity and has connected with people across differences and has a better inclination to create a system for all of those individuals. So I agree is, is, you know, build the healing practices, bring people together. We've, even systems have divided us. We wanna bring ourselves together. We wanna get to know one another. And from that unity, create systems that work for all. Uh, June, thank you. Wow. I boldly wrote to myself that I would try and synthesize a couple of key points. How mad can you get everybody? But I will have a go because 
this really matters and we're on our journey and we're really trying to capture key points. So I think some really important messages that came out was the need to stop being reactive, not to see leaders must not see themselves as prisoners of the moment, but there must also be an understanding, a kindness around those issues in terms of realizing this is not zero sum, that we are more in the space of reconciliation and healing, as we've heard so many times, than in finger pointing in ways that will put people's backs against the wall. We heard in different ways, ways a call to be radical that we need to move beyond this false binary that it's social not business to upend the paradigms and to understand that individuals and organizations see it will see it in their enlightened self-interest to do things that work for the community as a whole and which redress some of these deeply rooted injustices that have just been spoken of so eloquently we talked about movements. Movements need partnerships and those partnerships can be far more creative and bold across the divides. You've seen a brilliant example of that just this evening. We also focused on the importance of data and metrics. How do you make the argument in ways that are really incontrovertible? And although we didn't get time to talk of all the provocations, there was a very good question um, from Amari Rush about how do you speak better to government on these issues? And as we all know, the hard evidence is very important there. And then moving into internal cultural change, we differentiated between old recruitment and new recruitment um, of changing the profile of how we look at investments, how we connect to Main Street, how we target people who have hitherto been excluded and give them opportunities financially and through other, the other forms of support. And uh, lastly, um, and this was very moving for me listening to you both, um, I heard it also on our recent corporate governance forum. COVID brings all kinds of terrifying risks and sadness to every society and every family, and it's a nightmare on so many fronts. But if it is actually having a forcing function to allow us to think more deeply about courage and the moral compass of leadership, then something very important may be, accompl may be accomplished. Um, that is the way Salzburg Global positions itself right now in the heart of these converging crises. We see this pandemic as something which is a moral, a call to action for us all, and certainly for us as an institution. And I think a conversation like tonight's with all the amazing contributions from all of you um, has a very strong inspirational value to it. We will in a little while be posting provocations we received and once we've had a chance to package them, um, the great questions and resources that I think a lot of you were sharing in the chat box. Please, this is just a beginning. Um, we are very keen to open up the ways in which we have these dialogues and to take ideas and suggestions from all of you and to bring more dialogues like this up to the screen so that we feel closer to all of you around the world. Um, so thank you all of you because we know that everybody is Zoom beat out and you all made the time. Uh, thank you to the wonderful team who made this all happen so smoothly. Um, and most of all, thank you so much, Kurt Wickman, and La June Montgomery Tabron for what you have done and shared with us this evening and for the work that your organizations are doing uh, close to home and further from home. With that, stay healthy, everybody. And this is just the beginning, I hope. Thank you so much. Bye-bye for now.